Okay. You can see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. So let's start. So the first thing we want to talk about is the light cone and different sets of coordinates, the usual Cartesian coordinates. So the equation for the light cone is when the Minkowski metric is zero. So C squared T squared equals the X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared and you get a cone and I'll show you in a minute a better picture on Mathematica. And in the bipolar coordinates we learned about last time, uh, so if you take the norm, it's rho squared minus rho one squared because cosh squared minus sin squared is one and cosine squared plus sine squared is one. So this is the formula for the light cone, which means that rho zero equals plus or minus rho one. Rho one has to be positive, but rho zero can be positive or negative. So get some of these light cones in Mathematica. You can see the Mathematica now? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is the light cone in Cartesian coordinates. The horizontal axis are like the xy plane and the vertical axis is t. There's no room for z because it's a three-dimensional picture. We can't fit four dimensions in, but that's what it looks like. That's the light cone in the regular coordinates. If you use the bipolar, so we have several uh, options. We're going to look at uh, rho zero equals plus or minus rho one, and then theta ranges from minus infinity to infinity. So you get two half planes, which should really be at 90 degree angle there. And uh, vertically it extends in both directions to infinity. If you look at instead of theta phi and keep row one and row zero on the horizontal plane, so phi only ranges from zero to two pi. So again, you'll get two half planes, but it uh, only ranges from zero to two pi. They don't extend infinitely in, in any direction. Visualize it slightly differently. You can, uh, in the horizontal plane, you can take row one, uh, e in power i phi, the, the normal polar coordinates in the horizontal plane, and take rho take rho close the microphone. Please, everybody, close the microphone. Um, again, you take uh, like cosine phi, sine phi, r cosine phi, rho one sine phi in the horizontal plane, the normal polar coordinates, and rho zero vertically. And again, you get a cone. Very interesting. You also get a cone uh, when you look at these coordinates. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the present to the PowerPoint. And we learned about the local basis at any point. By differentiating R, you get a, a nice orthonormal local basis. And you can check easily that if you multiply any two vectors uh, using the Minkowski inner product, you'll get uh, either, you'll get zero. For example, D0, D2 is zero. And um, D0, D3 also, you'll get cosh singe minus singe cosh is also zero. And the length of each one is one or minus one, depending on if you're D0, the length is one, and D1, D2, D3, the length is minus one. So it's orthonormal basis. We'll also need later today in Jacob's presentation the corresponding dual basis, which means D with an upper, it's not really an index, it's a label, but these will now be co-vectors, and so the components have a lower index, and you uh, obtain the 
dual basis by applying the metric to the vector basis, to the original basis, and just lower what this means, since it's just the Minkowski metric, it means you apply minus one to the second, third, and fourth components. So D0 becomes cos, zero, zero, minus singe. D1 becomes zero, minus cosine, minus sine. Minus sine, yeah, just put a minus in the last three components. Now the local basis, the vector basis, not the dual basis, the local basis looks like this. So let's start with the left hand picture. The blue lines are lines of constant row one. So, and I'm looking at this point right here, which I call it's row one, cosine phi, sine phi. If you have a small change in row one, it's in this direction. And so a unit vector in this direction is called D1. And if you change phi, this represents a change in phi. And so the basis vector has to be tangent to the circle. And this is D2. And similarly, on the right-hand side, we get D0 and D3. It's almost the same picture, except instead of circles, you have hyperbolas of constant rho zero. So again, if you change rho zero, again, it's in the radial direction. And this will give you a unit vector D0. And if you change theta, so you, you're moving along the hyperbola, so you have to take a tangent vector to the hyperbola, and that gives you D3. And D1 and D2 are perpendicular in the usual sense, but uh, D0 and D3 are not in, not in the Euclidean sense perpendicular, but in the Minkowski metric sense, they are uh, orthogonal. We also saw last time a conjugation, and we'll need this also for the continuation. First of all, we had this embedding phi, you take a four vector and turn it into a two by two matrix. And it's very handy to know the inverse function. If you have the A, B, C, D, two by two matrix, you can recover the X by simply, how do you get the X zero back? You add X zero plus X three and X zero minus X three and divide by two. That's the A plus D divided by two. To get x1, you add the b and c and divide by 2. To get x2, you b minus c and divide by 2i. And for the last uh, component, you subtract and divide by 2. So it was very easy to get back to x. And the conjugation was defined in the following way. The conjugation applied to a four vector x. First, you compute phi of it, means you build this matrix. You multiply on the right by sigma three, and then pull it back to the four vector using the phi inverse. So you'll get x3 minus ix2, ix1, and x0. <coughs> and the conjugation is, this is the way it acts on the basis vectors. For example, let's compute the star of d1. So D1 is zero cosine phi sine phi zero. We apply the star, which means we have to switch X zero and X three, which are zero here anyway. And the second component is minus I times the third component here. So it's minus I sine and then I cosine, which is exactly I times D2. And then the dual basis works uh, similarly. Okay, we also saw a, a new representation of the Lorentz group. And we saw what the boosts look like, how they act, they're defined, and th this was the definition from the previous lecture, where this exponent is exactly this two by two matrix. And now you wanna see how this boost acts on four vectors. So we're gonna apply the boost to x0, x1, x2, x3, and then and build the matrix of this boost as an operator. So you multiply by, at first you multiply by sigma zero, which is the identity, so you're left with this matrix, and you pull it back. 
How do you get the first component? Add A and D and divide by two, subtract, you get the zero. Add B and C and you get the singe and subtract and you get the zero. And you do the same process acting on X1, which now means you have to multiply the exponent by sigma one and pull it back and you'll get singe and cosh. And when you multiply by sigma two, you'll get cosh and minus I singe and multiply by sigma three and you'll get I singe and cosh. And you put all four of these columns together in a matrix and this gives you the matrix of a boost in the x direction as an operator. So in, in the upper left hand part we have what looks like a regular boost like except it's with a half angle and in the bottom right part we have again cosh and singe with an i. If you use these identities you can replace cosh by cosine ix and i singe goes to sine ix. So here we have like a regular meaning trigonometric rotation but by a complex angle. And we're still trying to understand exactly what this means in the physics. And you want to get the generator of the boost. So you differentiate and plug in w equals zero or you take a W of S, a, a curve inside, and differentiate by S and plug in S equals zero. So where there's cosh becomes singe and you get a zero. Where there's singe, you get cosh with a one and the half comes outside by the chain rule. So this is the generator. The rotations are handled similarly, except now the exponent inside is a trigonometric. And you do the same thing, apply to X zero, which means multiply by sigma zero and pull it back with phi inverse and you get cosine I sine and the same for X1, X2, X3, straightforward calculations. And you put all of the columns together in a matrix and this is the matrix of the rotation about the X axis uh, as an operator. So in the bottom part, this is where a usual rotation would show up under the normal, the usual Lorentz, uh, the usual reputation of the Lorentz group. But now there's an added part with cosine and I sine, and you can use these identities to turn them into cosh and singe, but with a complex argument. So we have a regular rotation, but there's also a part here which is a complex boost. And the generator, you differentiate, cosine goes to sine, so you get a zero here. Sine goes to cosine, so you get a one. And uh, you get an I and the half comes outside. And this is the generator for the rotation. Okay, that's all I have. I'll hand it back to Yaakov. How do I do that? Where's Yaakov? Here he is. Okay.